what are corporations for? A lot of people will tell you that corporations have only one purpose, and that is to make the people who hold their shares today as rich as possible. Well, that's certainly one of the things that corporations do. But I'm here to argue that that's a really narrow, impoverished view of what corporations are for. In fact, corporations are one of the most important and brilliant inventions that humankind has ever come up with. What kind of an invention is a corporation? It's a time machine, a little bit like Doctor Who's TARDIS. But instead of moving Doctor Who back and forth through time, a corporation moves money back and forth between present and future generations, allowing them to, in effect, trade with each other in a way that benefits both. To understand how corporations move money through time, we need to begin by thinking about a really basic problem. And that problem is, how can we save resources that we have today so we can consume them tomorrow? And this is a really big problem that humans have faced for a long time. You have a lot of resources in the summer after the harvest, but how are you going to make sure you have enough food to eat in the winter? You may be, uh, you know, full of resources when you're young and youthful, and then you want them to be available to you when you're older and firm. And there are even people who want to save up resources to benefit their children and their grandchildren. How can we save things? Well, this problem is about as old as humanity is, and we've come up with some savings technologies. For example, a primitive saving technology is smoking meat to preserve it, so it's available in the winter. And of course, today we have a more modern saving technology we call money, which you can stick in the bank or under your bed. But it turns out there really isn't any really good saving technology out there. Even smoked meat will eventually spoil. And if you save money, you're always at risk that its value will be inflated away. So what's even better than a savings technology is an investment technology, a place that you can invest the resources that you pull together today so that they will generate benefits next year and the year after and the year after and the year after. You really want to invest, not just save. Well, this is an example of a primitive investment technology, an olive orchard. You plant the olive trees, and in three to five years, they'll begin fruiting. And olive trees can produce olives for decades, even centuries. It's a pretty good investment technology. But it's not as good as this relatively modern investment technology we call the corporation. This is the genius, the legal invention that humanity came up with that allows us to invest in really big projects that take a long time to come to fruition and that might be kind of uncertain. And there are two characteristics of the corporation that make it very suitable for these sorts of large-scale, long-term, somewhat uncertain investments. The first is something we call legal personality. What that means is that the corporation can own assets in its own name. The things that belong to the corporation are the corporations, and they don't belong to any human being. Just because you own stock in Apple doesn't mean you can waltz into an Apple store and take an iPad. The iPad belongs to Apple Company until you buy it. And legal personality is essential for corporations to be able to make long-term investments because legal personality is what keeps human beings from sucking assets out of the firm. So here we have a simple diagram of a corporation. As you can see, the corporation has as an asset a pile of money. And the money may have originally been contributed by the shareholders, shareholder one, shareholder two, and shareholder three, the little blue circles beneath our boxy corporation. And the corporation may be managed by the board of directors. But in a modern corporation, neither shareholders nor directors can take assets out of the corporation willy-nilly. Once shareholders contribute money, they only get back dividend, dividends if the board agrees to pay them, and the board itself is constrained from taking assets by the fiduciary duty of loyalty. So we have here a great invention that allows us to aggregate large amounts of money from lots of different shareholders and then sock it away. Sock it away for how long? Well, for a very long time indeed. 
because corporations, unlike human beings, can live decades, centuries. In theory, a corporation can live in perpetuity. And that's what makes it a great time machine. Now, what I've just said has an important caveat. Corporations are only great inventions for investing in the future when they do in fact have lock-in, the ability to protect their assets from being withdrawn by human beings. And the extent to which that is true is going to depend, among other things, on just how much influence shareholders have over the company and how much control they exert over it. And so once we start thinking about shareholder control, we can see that shareholder control exists along a spectrum. So in this diagram, over to the far left, we have the example of a corporation that has a single shareholder who owns 100% of the shares. That's a company that doesn't really have any lock-in. The shareholder owns all the stock and completely controls the board of directors and can cause that board of directors to pay out all the corporation's assets in the form of a dividend at any time. But as a corporation gets more and more shareholders, it gets harder and harder for those shareholders to act collectively to force the board to cough up corporate assets. So by the time we get to a classic public company with dispersed shareholders, which is almost all the way over to the right, we'll see that the company has a good deal of lock-in. If the board of directors thinks the company should hang on to its assets to make a long-term investment, the board of directors controls that decision. And of course, there are some corporations, particularly nonprofit corporations, that often have no shareholders at all. And those nonprofit corporations have very strong deg degrees of lock-in. They can aggregate assets and invest them in very long-term projects, safe in the knowledge that no human beings are going to have the power to show up and demand that the project be stopped and the assets be distributed. And this is what makes it possible for the present generation to contribute money into a corporation for the benefit of people who are going to come later on, people who may not even show up for centuries later. And here's a wonderful example. This is the Cathedral of Milan, one of the most beautiful pieces of architecture I've ever seen in the center of the city of Milan in Italy. And the Cathedral of Milan has been built by a corporate entity, the Veneranda Fabrica del Duomo di Milano, which began this project in 1386. This corporate project has gone on for more than 30 human generations, thanks to the corporate form. Here's another example of a long-term project that's being pursued by a corporation, Oxford University. This is a photo of the inside of Oxford's um, Great Hall in the New College, which was founded in 1379 and is still going strong. And there's an interesting story that goes along with the Great Hall. If you look at the top, you can see that beautiful wooden ceiling, and it's held up by massive oak beams. The reason is because oak grows very large and it's a very long lasting timber. But even oak, which can last for centuries, doesn't last forever. And when the beams in the Great Hall eventually give out, we're going to need to find some new, really big oak trees to replace them. So there's an interesting little, somewhat mythical story that goes along with the Great Hall in New College. And the story is that when the college was founded in 1379, the founders planted a grove of oak trees, planning to have them available four or 500 years later when they needed to replace the beams in the hall. Well, I want you to know that the archivist at New College has corrected this myth. The oak trees were not planted in 1379. They were actually acquired in 1441. And then New College hung on to them until the beams were finally used in 1863. So let's be accurate. The trees were acquired merely 440 years before they were actually used. But that's a great example of the way corporations can make, can pursue long-term strategies and preserve resources over long periods of time, even though I'm pretty sure that somewhere in that 450, 460 years, there were human beings who would have preferred to cut those trees down and sell them. 
but they weren't in charge. The corporate entity was. So far, of course, I've been talking about nonprofit corporations, though. And although nonprofit corporations allow the present generation to invest on behalf of future generations, that does presume that the present generation has a certain degree of altruism toward the future, that they want people who live in the future to have benefits. And of course, there are altruistic people, as we can see from Oxford University and from the veneranda. But not everyone is altruistic. So you can imagine two cave people. Our cave woman on the right is envisioning a future that's green and lovely and technologically advanced. And she's willing to make investments today to bring that future into existence. Our caveman on the left, he's a little less altruistic. He's perfectly happy to burn and eat everything in sight and leave nothing but a wasteland for future generations to come. And since real people are somewhat altruistic but not perfectly altruistic, wouldn't it be great if we could find a way to allow future generations to pay present generations to make the kinds of investments that can produce such wonderful benefits like Oxford University and the Milan Cathedral? Well, it turns out we actually have invented a way for those future generations to compensate present generations for making investments. And we did that by inventing the public corporation with shares that are widely held by members of the general public, and importantly, shares that are transferable on some kind of a stock exchange. And once you have a public company with transferable shares, we now have a time machine that not only allows the present generation to invest for the future, but also allows future generations to pay the present generation to do just that. And it hinges on this notion of transferable shares. So if you're older and you own a share of stock, you know you're not gonna be hanging onto it for very long, maybe a few years. And so if it weren't for transferable shares, you wouldn't want the company to make any long-term investments. But once you know that you can sell your shares to somebody younger, then you say, well, I'll be willing to make an investment as long as it raises the stock price today, because in effect, I'll be compensated for the profits that the stock market thinks the company is going to make years or decades further on. And of course, someone who's a bit younger than you is willing to buy that share because they're thinking in turn that they're eventually going to sell the share to someone even younger in what's been called a daisy chain of ownership that allows people, even people who are expecting to hold shares for a short period of time, to care about the company's long-term profits and about making investments that will generate long-term profits. So once we've got a public corporation with transferable shares in a reasonably efficient market, meaning a market where prices reflect not only today's profits, but profits the market thinks is going to show up in the future, our public business corporation has now become, in effect, a two-way wormhole in time that allows the present generation to invest money that's going to generate profits for future generations and allows the expectation of those future profits to raise the wealth and benefit present generations today. Now, once again, bear in mind this isn't true for all corporate entities. It's true for the great silverback public companies. The silverback, of course, is an older dominant gorilla. It's true for the gigantic public companies that we expect will be around for decades or centuries. But of course, we have experience with those great silverback corporations. And we see the way they are able to pursue projects that generate benefits for generation after generation after generation of humanity and contribute significantly to human progress and prosperity. So here are some classic Silverback Corporation contributions that you benefit from every day. We have a mainframe computer, which was developed, of course, by IBM, along with other corporations. That's the top left. We have, at the bottom, an electrical grid developed by, among other companies, General Electric at the turn of the century. 
still lighting our lights today. And we have the development of the electric elevator up on the upper right-hand side done by Otis Elevator Corporation and Siemens. And by the way, an electric elevator is both very difficult to design, it took decades to come up with a safe one, and it's also essential to our present day standard of living. No electric elevators, no skyscrapers. No skyscrapers, no cities. And today, large companies are still pursuing projects that are much more likely to bring benefits for future generations than for their present shareholders. So up at the top, Osiris is pursuing stem cell therapies and actually has treatments for breast cancer in clinical trials today based on stem cell therapy principles. Google at the bottom left is developing the self-driving car. I can hardly wait to get mine. And on the right-hand side, we see companies like SpaceX that are actually pursuing space exploration and interplanetary travel. Now, these are obviously very large-scale, long-term, uncertain projects. But if they succeed, the social benefits will be enormous and will last on and on into the future. But there is one problem. In reality, although stock markets are to a very great degree efficient, meaning that usually the stock price has some relationship to expected future profits, no one today really believes the stock market is perfectly efficient. We understand there will be times when the stock market will undervalue a project and be too pessimistic, perhaps about Google's self driving car. And of course, there will be times when the stock market's over-optimistic and overvalues the company. That's inevitable in a world where we're pursuing projects that are uncertain and the benefits, if any, won't show up until many years into the future. But it's a problem when shareholders have too much control and the company is in a phase where the stock market is undervaluing the benefits of its present day investments. Because at a time like that, if you're a shareholder who is expecting to sell soon, and by the way, the average holding period for shares in US public companies is only around six months or less, because you know, there are a lot of investment firms and funds and hedge funds that are trading very rapidly. You've got significant number of shareholders who are only thinking about the short term. And unless the company has got really solid lock-in and can stop those shareholders from taking corporate assets out, there's a danger that they're going to pressure the company to abandon its long-term investments in favor of strategies that will try and pump up the share price today in time for them to sell. Unfortunately, we actually have developing, at least in the United States, a situation in which there's reason to fear that short-term investors actually are interfering with our great corporation's ability to pursue long-term projects. And a lot of this is a result of this shareholder value thinking that I've described, where people believe that corporations have only one purpose, and that is to make their current shareholders as wealthy as possible. Based on this premise, We've seen a number of changes in federal law, in the tax code, in SEC regulations, in the rules that apply to pension and mutual funds that have encouraged companies to give more and more power to activist shareholders, so-called activist shareholders, and allow them to pressure boards. And unfortunately, since many of these activists, especially hedge funds, expect to hold their shares for at most a year or two, they are using their influence to drive companies to do things that push up share price in the short term, but very possibly at the expense of long-term investment and long-term returns. So here's a wonderful quote from William Bratton where he describes the results of an empirical study of what activist hedge funds look for. And you can see they look for the sorts of things, sale of the company, sale of part of the company, freeing up cash so that it can be distributed to shareholders, cash that otherwise might be invested, and then cutting costs, including so-called costs, like customer support or employee payroll or research and development, in order to get the share price up. When companies face these kinds of pressures, 
it becomes harder and harder them, for them to do what they were invented to do, to pursue these long-term projects, which raises the question, as we make it harder and harder for public and companies, for public companies to pursue long-term projects, who is going to be pursuing them? Who is going to be planting oaks? And if no one's planting oaks, where are our future roof beams going to come from? The problem is nicely captured in this New Yorker cartoon. Yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. That's what you get if you think of corporations only as vehicles for enriching the current generation of shareholders. Maybe we should think of them differently, more like time machines. <laughs>